You can go ahead, Jan. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, Jan Rassal here, Executive Chairman uh, for Damstra. We've just clicked on to nine o'clock, so I'll just give it another minute or so before we start to let all the attendees uh, uh, get access to this session. Uh, welcome, everyone. As I said earlier, um, Jan Rassel, Executive uh, Chairman for Damstra, and I think we've got uh, uh, a bit over 40 people that have joined uh, this morning's uh, telecon. Uh, I'm based in Melbourne today. Christian's uh, uh, actually in Denver in the, the US, and Chris Schultz, our CFO, uh, will be attending. Uh, I'll make some opening remarks, then Christian will go through uh, uh, the slide deck, and then Chris will make uh, some comments uh, about our financials. I suppose, why are we doing today? Uh, I've had the, uh, a number of investors saying to us, can we hear more from Damstra? Many people know, obviously, we see investment banks and we go on broker roadshows, but some of our shareholders don't get access uh, to those types of events. So we thought we'd be open and transparent. And every time we do a, a quarterly update, we'll now have a, uh, a session uh, in an ongoing sense. So this won't be a once-off. Uh, this will uh, continue to be the way we communicate with our investor base. I would like to say, I mean, the revenue on a PCP basis is uh, up 20%. Uh, it is uh, disappointing uh, from our perspective. Uh, we had given guidance and, and the market expectation was that we would grow uh, at 30% uh, plus uh, during the course of this year. And Christian will talk more about uh, that dynamic later. But I will say from a, a board perspective and an executive perspective, it's uh, been a modest uh, start, to the, start to the year. But having said that, there are some positives uh, news uh, overlaid with some disappointing news. Uh, I will say up front uh, that the Newmont uh, uh, client, which is one of our largest clients globally, uh, we are being descoped from that. Uh, Christian will talk uh, about that in more details in terms of uh, what has happened, uh, why we're disclosing it now and not earlier, and also the implications to our business, but importantly, um, our learnings from that. And then when you look at our numbers and look at our releases, you can see that uh, that has impacted uh, AAR, but also impacted uh, revenue. While we did grow at 20% uh, this year, if I did take hypothetically Newmont out of the PC basis, we would have actually grown at uh, 31% just to so to uh, investors, our base business is still uh, actually growing. Some people then talk about clients, you know, if um, Damster, are you having problems with Newmont? Are you having problems with others? I mean, Christian, myself and the executive team have actually spoken to all our top 10 clients uh, in the last couple of months, be it uh, Glencore, uh, NBN, John Holland, CBP, and we have incredibly strong relationships with them. And I think the evidence behind that, as we announced today, is we've just signed uh, a new five-year extension uh, uh, with John Holland, uh, which we announced today, which uh, is a validation of our relationship with them. Uh, NBN, which we previously announced, which was a contract extension, uh, is going well and is actually above um, our internal plans. And recently, Christian met with senior executives of CBP uh, and we're talking about the quality of our relationship and with CBP, we're on, I think, more than 30 locations across the country um, at the moment. Uh, in the pack, you'll see that even though we've had this performance, uh, our enterprise protection platform strategy is unchanged and it continues to evolve. And that's a resonation that we have uh, from all our clients that we're speaking to. Uh, and also our focus on North America remains uh, unchanged. And Christian is actually in uh, Denver as we speak and will be there for a, a little period now to focus on North American uh, pipeline uh, and expansion. Um, 
In the, the note too, I mean, we've been listed now for a bit of uh, over two years and one thing, the board uh, and the non-executive directors, we do have four non-executive directors uh, uh, on our board. Uh, we always look at uh, management uh, renewal and that's something that we spent a lot of time on in the last uh, three to six months. And as you would have saw in the release, uh, one of the big changes for us is uh, Sam, uh, the ex-CEO of uh, Tix, who's now joined uh, our company, uh, will take over the uh, chief commercial officer role, looking after commercialisation opportunities, but also all of ANZ uh, business development. And Christian will talk more about Tix uh, and Sam uh, in the future. We also did announce uh, in the release today that David Moreland, the ex-CEO uh, of Vault, uh, will leave the organisation. Uh, and we thanked, thanks David uh, for his contribution uh, to the business. Well, when I look at the business too, I mean, while the top line is disappointing, I think it's also important to highlight the positives of the business. Uh, um, we've seen uh, our construction clients, and I just called out our three major clients, you know, in the quarter for the first time surpassed $1 million uh, of revenue and growth was in excess of uh, uh, 70%. And in construction, we now have across our portfolio nearly 100,000 users uh, in Australia. Uh, we were impacted by COVID. Uh, in Q1, and we saw a big uptick in September, and that continues into October when the COVID uh, lockdowns are now obviously falling away in New South Wales and Victoria. So we see that growth in that sector continuing. Our user numbers uh, are still growing, as you as you saw, and also we still win new clients. You know, uh, in the quarter we put on a net uh, nine new clients in our business, so that gives us comfort that parts of our business are performing extremely um, strongly. Uh, we talk, you know, we did an acquisition of ticks, which uh, Christian will talk about. I mean, a couple of highlights that I will make is uh, uh, Sam is joining our organisation, as investors would see, took uh, most of his consideration in terms of script uh, at a dollar share price uh, and also a scrap for two years. And Sam will take a senior role in our business and we think he'll add a uh, significant contribution to Damstra. And you can show his commitment to the business by him taking that consideration and taking that consideration at uh, $1. Uh, we have also uh, updated our guidance. When people do the math, they'll see our old guidance and our new. And, and in one sense, uh, it is little changed. Uh, but when you do the math, you can see our performance versus our projections versus the addiction of ticks of where we are. So I will highlight that our, you know, our guidance is in the 36 to $39 million uh, for this year. And uh, we have some comfort around that in terms of ticks and what's happening in places uh, uh, like construction. So I thought I'd make those opening remarks. And like I said, uh, earlier, we, we are disappointed with only 20% uh, growth. If Newmont wasn't there, it would have been 31%. Uh, we're learning uh, from Newmont, but we do have parts of that business that are performing extremely well uh, and also a great pipeline of opportunities. Uh, to, after Christian and Chris speak, we'll obviously open up uh, to Q&A, either verbally Q&A or via chat. So I'll pass over to Christian now. Thank you, Jan, and uh, appreciate the, those words to start with. Um, let's get uh, straight forward to uh, the presentation and go through the results. $6.2 million of revenue, 20% uh, growth, uh, as Jan was pointing out, of burnt uh, against uh, the previous period. 87.3% recurring revenue versus 84.7 in Q4 FY21, 29.3 million ARR, 77% uh, gross margin. $7.7 .7 million of cash receipts. And of course, uh, uh, overall users up to 746,000 uh, users. A uh, few gross uh, metrics there across uh, showing the uh, increased ARR versus PCP. Um, not sure why that slide keeps auto changing. Um, and you can see that uh, drop there. And uh, however, they included ticks in there to give a total of 32.3. Increasing cash receipts. And of course, continuing to uh, get that growth in those users. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Newmont, et cetera, in just a moment. So growth overview, uh, past 95,000 users in the construction industry. We've seen record growth in the construction industry just continuing to, uh, to grow off the back of uh, COVID incentives and all those things as we come out of COVID. And we expect to continue to see that to grow uh, as uh, these restrictions around Australia 
uh, removed uh, uh, more completely uh, in the coming months. The construction vertical, as I said there, which includes three core clients, generated a million dollars of revenue in Q1. That's 74% growth, once again, fueled by those uh, projects that are being rolled out across Australia. The MBN contract is uh, in full operation now, performing well ahead of plan. And of course, growth achieved in the quarter was negatively impacted by the Newmont descoping. If I just pause there and talk about Newmont for a moment, because it is a pretty major uh, um, disappointment for our organisation. What, what happened? I mean, uh, we went, went into Newmont almost four years ago. We did a global deal with Newmont. Uh, we rolled out, uh, the system was doing its job. Uh, and certainly today, Newmont are happy to, uh, to say that the system did its job and did everything it said it was going to do. Uh, where the challenge came in is they've had a lot of um, turnover through COVID uh, at their corporate uh, level. And everything we did was from the corporate level rolled out to their different regions. As late as uh, the end of the financial year, we had in writing that they were renewing their contract. Uh, everything was going ahead. They were going to stop using our hardware, but everything else was going ahead and they were happy with that. Uh, it's only been in the last few weeks they've started, uh, last couple of months, I should say, they've started uh, winding a couple of the sites back and started descoping the actual rollout on the rest of the sites. And uh, we've been in discussions and negotiations with them on that. What it appears they're doing at the moment is they're going to more of a site-based site uh, discussion where each of the sites will uh, do different things. They're not going to control it from a corporate perspective. And they're actually uh, not going to be dictating what each site uses, um, which is uh, really disappointing. And that's what that's seen them do is actually uh, actively work on shutting the system down on the sites that weren't fully rolled out due to those COVID delays. Certainly we're still operating on uh, three of their sites today and the user numbers on those sites are still continuing as we speak. And we are in discussions with them right now. I actually have meetings with them next week in Denver to talk about those sites and what's going to happen moving forward. We thought it was timely uh, given where we are with the contract and that's why we didn't speak about it sooner because it really only has come about uh, in, in the last couple of uh, months and uh, certainly nothing's finalised. Uh, right now and we are talking to them about our opportunities moving forward and what that means for us but of course um, for us it's disappointing we spent a lot of time rolling out Newmont we were very happy with how things were going uh, we have sat down with uh, as Jan said the other top 10 clients and uh, certainly uh, three of those uh, largest clients um, have uh, given us uh, glowing references just in the last fortnight alone to uh, the other mining company we've been speaking to here in the US so uh, Certainly there's no uh, negativity there and uh, no issues and we'll continue to service those customers uh, the way we always have and maintain that um, customer retention rate, um, obviously being affected by uh, Newmont, but uh, we'll continue to uh, push that back and, uh, and, and resolve that. So that's where we got to with Newmont and uh, I'll uh, keep going with the rest of the presentation and we'll take questions a little later. Of course, John Holland signed their five-year contract and that trial I just mentioned a moment ago is going fantastic, trial's over. We are negotiating, we are having conversations. Our next meeting is actually next week and uh, obviously not gonna go into too much detail or timing there, but we are uh, feeling really comfortable with that and hopefully we can announce uh, in due course. Products and technology, our strategic pivot to EPP and our new product lexicon, which is included in this pack, continues to simplify and evolve and we're still getting great feedback on that. And uh, certainly we continue to invest and we'll continue to invest in that platform and make sure that it's a platform that nothing else could uh, possibly uh, compare to. Our paperless form users now exceed over 15,000 users, reflecting rapid growth of 50% on the PCP basis, which is just fantastic. And it shows how many businesses really want to go digital uh, during uh, this period of COVID and, and continuing on from there because they realize the benefits of it. Uh, saving companies millions of dollars a year by going paperless, it's, it's just fantastic. New products, of course, our COVID record management. I mean, that's not to be downplayed. A lot of work went into that and uh, it was done in record amount of time. So in areas like Western Australia, where it's been mandated um, and in Victoria, where it's been mandated, if you work on a construction site, if you work on a resource site, you must have a vaccination. Um, we uh, sat down with our customers. We understood their needs. It's not just a matter of saying that everybody will upload their vaccination because of course you have people who don't want to upload their vaccination. They don't want to share medical data. And there's ways we have to deal with that. So not only did we give our customers the ability to upload those vaccination records into our system and have them automatically not access the gates if they haven't got their vaccination records. And then if they arrive on site and they can't get through the gate, 
a supervisor, manager, safety person can actually use our digital form system to actually get that person's vaccination records on the spot and open that gate for them within 30 seconds. So that's been a, uh, a major step forward uh, for our customers in that area. And uh, we're really comfortable with how that's growing. Of course, satellite uh, pilots underway going extremely well. And numerous new products are in UAT right now, including our return to work uh, system and our safety tool, Dentra Safety. Of course, the skills matrix and our data lake, uh, which we're working very hard on the data lake to uh, do more with our predictive analytics that we've spoken about previously. From a corporate level, of course, our COVID impact, estimated revenue impact of 0.5 of a mil, reflected in project delays and lower user numbers in the workforce module. Realistically, it's just caused slowdowns of many different things. It hasn't been that we've lost many clients throughout COVID. It's really been around that lack of user numbers, lack of people making decisions, and people really just resting until COVID comes to an end. So uh, we're looking forward to that uh, growth coming uh, as we come out of COVID. Our SOC 2 uh, reviews uh, in process, our ISO has been recertified. And of course, our AWS partner accreditation is uh, still going extremely well. And I uh, actually have a meeting with the head of AWS mining uh, next week in, uh, in Denver as well. So uh, some great things happening over here. Of course, we did the TIX acquisition with approximately 70 clients, uh, FY21 revenue of 4.1 million. And, and really excited to have Sam Marciano, uh, the founder and CEO of TIX, becoming our chief commercial officer of Damstra. He truly is an entrepreneur and uh, somebody who's very passionate about what his organization did and is passionate about what our greater organization does and can do together moving forward. Uh, for him, it's very much like myself. It's about keeping people safe on the work site. We've said that from day one, we continue to remain passionate about that and we continue to develop technology that helps people achieve that goal. And working together with Sam, I know that he's going to bring a lot to our organization and really help us get that growth as the commercial officer moving forward. It was uh, really paramount in the fact that he was willing to take a uh, majority of his uh, consideration in Dancer stock at $1 per share. It shows the, uh, the faith he has in our organization and I'm uh, pleased to have him there. It increases our R&D bench strength. He has a great development team. Uh, they'll of course be uh, all, all brought into the one team very, very shortly and we'll uh, continue to uh, report back on the positive uh, impacts that has on the business. More advanced permit to work functionality. It expands our international footprint. They had a few small international customers, but they didn't have an international footprint. So it allows us to better service those customers and grow off the back of that. Uh, strong in facility, facilities management, an area that we weren't doing much in, and we see a lot of opportunity there using our tools with Sam's tools to really accelerate that. And of course, the deep partner integrations that they have. So really pleased with the TIX acquisition and where we are with that today. Over here, uh, we're talking about our product uh, lexicon. Really important because as everyone knows, we have done a number of acquisitions over the years and we've got uh, an ever evolving product going down that enterprise protection platform route. And of course, the enterprise protection platform is made up of many different modules. But over the years, they've all been called different things and it's got quite confusing for customers and new customers and certainly our sales team. So we've spent the time with our new head of marketing based here in the US to pull together what our actual names are going to be and what that means. And we've actually shared this with our customers as well. And we've had great feedback. So the old Damstra Learning will now be called e-learning and Damstra Solo will of course just be called Solo. Enterprise protection platform remains and all those different names of what each module does is listed there. But it shows you the depth of our enterprise protection platform and the power of all those modules working together. So we thought it was pertinent that we share that uh, with you today. And we'll continue to evolve this as we move forward uh, and add more functionality to the EPP as we uh, work with our customers very closely. Our growth strategy, of course, uh, geography, North America, key growth pillar, continue to scale up uh, the North American business, um, build out the UK business and continue to build our user numbers via product cross-sell and increased client penetration. Of course, our verticals and channels, new verticals with facilities management and rail, areas we haven't really played in, but we've got great cross-functionality available through the TIX acquisition. Smaller clients, we've seen an increased uh, product take up, uptake in our smaller clients and we'll continue to support those with those different modules, whether it's one, two or three modules they're using, we wanna to continue to foster those smaller clients and really drive that out so they get access to the whole EPP platform over many, many years. And of course, deepening and expanding our partnerships 
not only through the TICS acquisition, but with the, uh, the partnership team and all the work we're doing there to grow that product. We're working very hard to finalize even more workflows and increase the rollout of paperless forms and workflows across our major clients. Data analytics remains at the forefront. We're continuing to build that out and we're looking forward to releasing that to our customers uh, later in uh, the financial year. And of course, EPP is paramount to our uh, future and continue to build that out and, uh, and get that out there with the uh, integrated TICS opportunity and uh, the new functionality. On the TICS acquisition, TICS were a Sydney-based uh, software as a service uh, business operating since 2011. Total consideration of $18 million comprising two and a half million cash on completion, 12 million in fully paid ordinary shares issued on completion and three and a half million cash payment deferred for 12 months. Excuse me, a little bit dry over here in Denver. An additional 7 million comprised of uh, issued shares payable to the vendors if certain uh, performance targets are achieved in the 12 months following completion. Um, key metrics, 4.1 million in revenue, 4.4 times revenue multiple as effectively uh, what the acquisition price was, 20 employees, 70 clients. And of course, we talked a little bit about Sam before. Sam has 18 years of experience in software uh, business development and specialising in SaaS-based products. He was a 68% TIC shareholder and has agreed to a 24 month voluntary escrow of his issued shares. Sam has of course joined our exec team as the chief commercial officer. HP Technology was the other vendor trading as Hunter Bay Partners, a direct investment advisory firm based in New South Wales, invested in TIC since 2018, 29% shareholder and have agreed to a 12 month voluntary escrow of their issued shares. Complementary product, so we have similar offerings in some areas around workforce and access control, but it adds new functionality also in areas such as permit to work, mobile applications, and even deeper partner integration. Industry alignment, we serve similar industries, the dirty and the dangerous, which include mining, construction, utilities, but also rail, aviation, and facilities management. Clients include BGIS, Tech Resources, Cushman and Wakefield, and Honeywell. Uh, market leadership, a combination of two like-minded and reputed uh, workforce management solution providers in Australia. We both have similar visions, as I said before. We both want to grow internationally and we both are very passionate about keeping people safe. Strong team of developers will bolster our product team development and innovation capability. New South Wales office location brings operational synergies. Cultural fit, we are similar businesses, product focused and growth vision. So a really good cultural fit there. And of course, we talked about the financial impact uh, acquired an attractive revenue multiple of 4.4 times, 4.1 million of FY21 revenue, bringing additional scale before synergies. The business is operating cash flow positive and it will lead to immediate value creation. If we have a look at the complementary product suite on the next slide, we have highlighted there what items are complementary and what items are new. So you can see it was majority complementary there, which is something we were really happy about because it helps us bring it all together into the one uh, EPP very easily. But adding those different modules to give us the permit to work, the worker scheduling, and that enhanced partner integration. Um, I might just pause there before I stop entirely and hand over to Chris Scholes, who can talk a little bit more to the numbers before we go back to the uh, Q and A's, if that's okay. Chris, are you available? Oh, thank you, Christian. Um, thank you for joining everybody. Just, um, I'm not going to go through the numbers in detail. I uh, just I'll make a couple of call outs, sort of in anticipation of of of, um, of questions. The um, the the one the one thing that I do want to highlight is in terms of license numbers increasing um, despite the revenue. Not um, this is again that's all to do with uh, the mix of clients and the mix of modules. And specifically, we had a much higher ARPU um, uh, uh, revenue per user from Newmont. So that makes us sort of drop down a little bit. We do expect that to increase again, though, as we uh, as we bring these new clients on board. Um, and then the other comment I'll just make quickly. So in our year-end presentation, we made uh, we made quite a few comments around um, free cash flow and how we get back on a path to free cash flow. I will call out that we are still on plan in terms of expenses. 
um, and that number is still very achievable. Uh, it does depend on us meeting that guidance um, and, and our revenue targets, which which we would expect to do going towards the uh, the back half of the year. Um, in terms of other numbers, we are we I mean we still are pleased with the fact that a large part of our revenue is recurring, so we still have a very stable client base, and we are still maintaining our margins, uh, especially on the gross margin level, as we as we call out there. So so once we meet guidance, we'll we'll be back. Um, uh, once we once we lift up our revenue, I should say, then we'll be back to where we need to be. I think that's all I wanted to call out. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so uh, from there, I think, uh, Jan, we might go back to uh, questions and answers. Yeah, hi, hi, everyone. A few people are putting questions uh, via chat, but also happy to take them uh, verbally also. So... Ross, you, I mean, uh, Matt, you might have to organise that if people want to organize, ask questions verbally. Uh, Claude's asked a question. Uh, hi, Claude. Uh, th thanks for joining. Uh, yeah, you are right uh, on that comment. Uh, I suppose there's a couple of comments to that. When I speak to analysts and shareholders, you get a really polarised view on guidance. Uh, many people want you to have it uh, with uh, a strong assertion so they can measure the company's performance uh, in terms of what they say and do they deliver. Uh, other people, such as yourself, Claude, and I know you've said that to, to us before, is why do it? Because a number of listed companies don't do it. Uh, I suppose last year when we missed our guidance, I had a lot of feedback saying you should continue to, to do it and then you should uh, deliver it. However, we are disappointed, uh, I suppose, in December and November when our numbers uh, were looking uh, particularly strong. Uh, one, COVID uh, came again, which has impacted our business, which was uh, uh, you know, unexpected. And to be quite honest, we didn't expect uh, this new one issue uh, to occur. Uh, and there has been a little bit of slippage in these opportunities in the UK and US, albeit, as Christian has said, for both those opportunities, we're the only person standing in the room speaking to those clients. So, so Claude, I, I continue to take feedback from shareholders uh, on what they uh, do, but I thought for this quarter, rather than just removing guidance, give a view uh, of what our guidance would be for the year. Uh, and at the end of the day, people may be disappointed with our numbers, but we're still, you know, uh, a 36, 39, $40 million business at the end of this year. And that's what we're chasing. So I uh, hope that answers the question. Uh, uh, Andrew, asks a, Andrew asks a question of, uh, is our cost base being adjusted for loss of our business? Yeah, I mean, if, I mean, in terms of the plan, we, you know, well, we don't disclose the, the business plan, but our revenue is down, but our costs uh, have also, are also beneath plan uh, at the end of the day. So that's something we balance. I suppose, Andrew, it's just a balance of the last thing you want to do is close down uh, your developers because you always want to keep your base product growing, you want to integrate new products and you want to develop new products and we, and you want to uh, uh, go forward in terms of developing uh, Salesforce uh, to pursue those opportunities. We did call out in a full year pack, uh, we did see pockets of free cash flow, but obviously for this quarter that didn't occur and that's just so, slowly dri driven by our revenue miss if we would have uh, achieved our plan in, uh, in Q1, uh, we would have seen a pocket of free cash flow again. So it's something we're, we're continuing to review, Andrew. So hopefully that uh, answers the question. Uh, what assumptions underpin your FY22 guidance? Uh, Chris, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the thing. So Guidance, we've got a cost base or a stable base of our existing clients, which we are not concerned about. So, so we we do expect to, to meet our numbers based on that. But then there is an assumption on these new clients rolling out um, and, and, and kicking off very... In, in, those contracts being closed in the, this year and kicking, kicking off in quarter three of next year. So that... I suppose that is the one bit that we do need to 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 um, 
for, for us to lay to meet that 36 million. It's not an unachievable number. It's a very achievable number. Um, but we will have to, like I said, we will just have to make sure that we land and implement those contracts um, within the next sort of three to four months. Uh, well, Christian, there's a, a, a question from Sean mm. regarding uh, the trials. Yeah. So talk about those, which are more interesting. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Q1 presentation, we mentioned negotiations or trials. They're actually trials with three gold miners, a, a diamond miner, a large healthcare company, and a construction company. Uh, yeah, give you an update on those. So the, the gold mining sites, uh, they're actually sites we're still uh, working through um, and, and going really positively there. The diamond miner's got a little quiet. The healthcare company is still on track. Uh, we're having great conversations um, around the uh, all, all 50, uh, 52 states uh, that they operate in. And the construction company uh, is still in uh, discussions as well at a very high level. We haven't gone deep enough there yet. But uh, those things certainly aren't dead. Uh, we are still making progress. Uh, but as with uh, many things we've seen over the last uh, 18 months, two years, um, very slow at making decisions and really locking in, which has caused uh, some of those slowness in, uh, in revenue coming through. But uh, certainly uh, still good progress happening there. I might grab that next one as well uh, from Andrew Gracie there, Jan. Uh, does Damstra monitor their customers' experiences? Clearly sites at Newmont were not happy. Um, firstly, we do monitor our customer experience and we're actually getting better at it every day. We've actually got a fantastic customer uh, success team now, a customer success manager who looks after that team. We monitor it, we track it, uh, we do net promoter scores, we do all those types of things and we're getting great data and feedback out of that and uh, certainly we're improving uh, off the back of that every day. It's not really fair to say sites at Newmont weren't happy. Uh, we've got sites that were extremely happy uh, who are still using our product today and that's why we're still having uh, conversations around that. This is more of a, uh, a corporate event that's occurred uh, with the amount of change uh, at the corporate level. Um, they shut their office in, uh, in Denver nearly uh, two years ago now and have only just opened it up in the last few weeks. And as a result of that, a lot of people left their organisation. They didn't want to uh, operate uh, working from home. So they actually left the organisation and left the country in many places. Um, and the new people that have come in have decided that uh, they don't want to control every site. They don't want to have one system that they put in and be responsible for. So I think um, it's not a matter of any site being uh, disappointed or unhappy with that. Um, it was purely uh, an event that occurred at a, uh, at a corporate level. Thanks, Jan. Uh, I think anonymous attendee said pipeline and what conditions for new user and clients looking into Q2. Yeah, I can, I can grab that. Of course, um, you know, uh, we, the pipeline is strong. Um, we're, we're heading up sort of uh, circa uh, 60, $70 million in the pipeline in Australia alone. Um, uh, 20 and $30 million in the US and, and continuing to grow that as well as our partner pipeline being uh, extremely high as well. Um, we're being very careful to make sure we're only putting qualified leads into those pipelines and working through those. Uh, not going to talk about any falling into QT and giving Q2 and giving guidance like that. We've fallen into that trap before uh, with the uh, UK K client that uh, we're still talking with and still making progress with, uh, but got hugely delayed by COVID. So I don't want to give any exact details on that uh, but certainly uh, there is some positive discussions underway right now. Yeah, I suppose another comment on, on uh, pipeline was we did call out construction and passing a, a million dollars in the quarter. And uh, I think in the note we had, you are working on 50 plus projects across Australia. And I think all of us know that the state and federal governments are spending a huge amount of uh, capital on new projects across all types of industries. And, you know, I think one of the lucky things we have in our business, we're positioned with a lot of the tier one infrastructure uh, constructors. And, and uh, I think we actually called out, I think our growth was 70%. I would have a view that that pipeline would grow 100% plus on a PCP basis based on the project uh, pipeline that we actually see with our present clients and alone winning, uh, um, winning new ones. Uh, I see uh, Vince and Hamish uh, talk about cash. I mean, that's something we do look at. I mean, Vince, uh, yeah, when the share price was at uh, uh, $2, uh, in hindsight, it would have been a good time to raise more cash to uh, continue to expand. I suppose my only comment is we have a debt facility there. Yes, we do have cash and it's something we just continue to monitor on a month and quarter by uh, quarter basis. Uh, I think... 
uh, Kitan, if, uh, if I knew that question, I think we'd all be uh, very wise people. So, uh, you know, I suppose I feel uh, our share price and so does Christian and so does Chris. We're all shareholders of Damstra and, and we're significant shareholders of Damstra. Uh, I suppose one thing that gives us some solace is Sam, who's joined us, took uh, the consideration at $1 was higher than our share price. And so I suppose the only comment is we can't predict our share price uh, our performance over time will drive our share price and the credibility of uh, uh, management uh, delivering on what it says, and hopefully uh, it goes up. But uh, we are as aligned as you in terms of the share price because of the stake we have in the company. Uh, Christian, uh, Anonymous, mm. uh, talked about that side-by-side -side model. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Could we see other global clients moving to a side-by-side -side model versus corporate rollout? Look, the answer is no, and the reason for the answer being no is we don't have any other global clients who have pushed us to every other single site. So all the other large organisations we deal with, like the CPBs, the Glencores, um, you know, the uh, Bengalas, the MBNs, I mean, they're all uh, local and uh, not global rollouts. Um, so we don't see that. But there was a lot of learning we did through the Newmont process. There's no doubt about that. So obviously, uh, we have mentioned before, we are working with another global customer at the moment, and we're hoping to sign them up and uh, we're in discussions with them, but we have approached it differently and they have approached it differently because we've been uh, able to have these conversations in the last couple of weeks with them. So uh, it's, it's been a really uh, good learning curve for us. So not, not concerned about the other customers we have today, but certainly some learnings there for us to take forward. Yeah, and I, and I think Newmont's also a wake up call for us because I'm mean, at a board level, Christian and myself, and obviously the independent directors have very strong views on these things. And some of uh, the executives, uh, our Neds, uh, work, did work for global companies. Uh, Morgan Hurwitz in particular uh, worked for Orica. Simon Yenkin was a chairman of Akinex. And, and we reflect on, on how we deploy globally. But the vision is to become a global organisation. And I think uh, after two years being listed and uh, going to IPO, I think we've learned a lot from this. And I think someone's asked a question here, uh, have we changed our account management structure? And interestingly, we have. You know, in the last six months, we've put in a dedicated uh, account management structure. Um, so what you do have is for senior accounts, you have a senior executive aligned to them. So every account uh, uh, in our business, about 700 clients, has a dedicated, we call them customer service manager, uh, that deals with them on a day-to-day, -day, week by week, month-to-month -month basis. And obviously, larger customers have a multi-pronged uh, relationship, depending on how deep our relationship uh, um, is with them. Yeah, that's right, Jan. And just to uh, add to that, uh, like I said before, we've enhanced our customer success team, our customer success manager. Um, we are now doing uh, regular surveys. Uh, we've increased the amount of times we talk to our customers on a, uh, on a weekly and monthly basis. Um, we're getting a lot of great feedback from the customers uh, over that. Um, are we making more changes? Absolutely. Are we constantly reviewing um, our executive team and all those types of things to make sure we've got the right people in the right positions? Uh, the answer is, uh, is, is yes. Um, so uh, somebody did ask there as well if I was moving back to the US to uh, stay on top of those customers. I think, uh, look, I'm in the US right now. Uh, I'm here for uh, three, four weeks right now. Um, I'm going to be coming back here in two and three months stints um, moving forward to make sure that uh, the team has the support they need uh, and can and help us move forward with that. Just to be clear, that's not what caused the breakdown of, of Newmont. I mean, uh, even with me being uh, back in Australia, we had a very close relationship with Newmont um, and a lot of uh, things occurred uh, to get us to the position we are uh, at there. And I'm very disappointed uh, that we're in this position and it's certainly something I'm working very hard to uh, try and resolve and see what else we can do moving forward. I know somebody in the general chat did ask, are there opportunities to recoup potential lost revenue from Newmont by having direct conversations with the sites? We are having those conversations. We are talking to the sites. We are seeing what we can do. It's certainly not an easy road and not an easy one to do given where we've come from and what we've done with Newmont so far, but we'll continue to have those conversations. And if anything comes from that, we'll update the market as appropriate. But uh, Believe me, we're doing everything possible to uh, keep that on track. And customer um, satisfaction and customer happiness is very, very uh, important to me, something I'm very passionate about. And uh, certainly, as Jan said before, we have executives assigned to these uh, accounts and uh, we're making them get very involved with these deals to make sure 
that these customers don't feel like they've got a system that uh, uh, they've got to look after themselves, that they've got the support and it's a true partnership. And I think that's paramount in when you look at our customer retention rates over the last 21 years and how solid they've been. Yes, we've now had a blip in the radar. Yes, we've lost a customer. Uh, it's not something that's happened a lot and it's not something we want to see happen again. So we are taking that very seriously and we are working through those issues. So have, have, thanks for the question. Sorry, Jan. No, that's right, Christian. Uh, anonymous attendee, only large client renewals. The, the two big, the three big ones were Newmont, which you know, and then NBN and John Holland. And I don't think Chris, anyone in our top five is up for renewal apart from those two. So, uh, yeah, so I think, I think, yeah. I was just going to say the next big one is only in 2023, at the back end of 2023. So we've got... Um, no, no other issue or no, um, no other big renewals are coming up soon. Okay. Uh, Daniel asked a question here, Christian, on pipeline to sale. I mean, that does vary, obviously, significantly. It, var it varies a lot, Jan. I mean, as we've said before, we've had customers go from uh, a phone call to live in a, in a month, and we've had others take two years. And uh, certainly with COVID, it's, uh, it's pushed things out. Right now, it's fair to say the big deals. You know, the ones that are sort of a million dollars plus, those types of things are certainly taking at least 12 months. Um, some of the smaller ones are, are less, um, but it certainly is much more extended right now uh, due to that COVID impact. Um, and we see that tightening up and getting faster, um, but uh, that's where we are today. Uh, Marianas has asked a question about mm. the New Zealand, hopefully I've said your name right. Uh, we only talked about that six weeks ago, so we are... Uh, Still in discussion uh, with our clients, and uh, we will see how that progresses uh, in the next couple of months. But uh, from a guidance point of view, there's no revenue planned uh, for that New Zealand client. I, I will extend to that. Uh, people may ask, hey, that happened with Bolt. What about ticks? Uh, we personally spoke to uh, all of the five key clients in the ticks business. Uh, at some length uh, before we completed the transaction and very positive, you know, that they saw the opportunity of uh, ticks being smaller scale, coming together with more products, having larger scale, et cetera. So we're very comfortable with uh, the top clients uh, in ticks and deep, deep, deep due diligence. And also none of those contracts are uh, a take or pay contract as was the case uh, with that New Zealand client. Uh, Christian, uh, Anonymous has asked, yeah. Uh, UK business? Yeah. yeah, look, the UK business is uh, is an area, of course, that uh, we still want to grow. Um, we have uh, a full-time person still there helping grow that business. We are recruiting a new business development person there as we speak, somebody who uh, can hopefully uh, grow that business faster than what the last business development person did. We still are in discussions and, and going really well with those discussions with that potential client that we've spoken about many times before. Um, and we'll uh, continue to support the, uh, the UK business. There's also some ticks business in the UK as well that uh, will, of course, uh, be uh, working to grow now that we have a presence there and ticks didn't. Um, and uh, certainly one of those conversations has already happened this week, which was uh, pleasing to see. So uh, some good things happening there. In five years, look, we, we, as we've always said, we'd love to see more international revenue than domestic revenue, and that includes out of the US and the UK. Um, so we have a way to go there and we want to continue to grow that, but we are very keen on the UK growing. Down, I might grab this next one from Alex. Um, hey, as well, um, can you discuss the integration plan for ticks, i.e. revenue growth for ticks you expect and uh, cross sales uh, opportunities? Of course, ticks is a very solid platform and uh, doing extremely well and continuing to grow. Um, but they've actually got some partnerships with uh, other organisations that uh, we will uh, look at actually replacing those partners uh, with our own platform and our own products that will help us to actually displace some of those, um, those companies and also pick up some of that revenue and get more share into our organisation overall. So we do see some good cross synergies there and some good opportunities to grow that revenue uh, very rapidly uh, as we move forward. And uh, certainly uh, Sam and I are talking a lot. I spoke to Sam just prior to this meeting and uh, we're very aligned on what needs to be done to go after those opportunities at, at a rapid pace. And uh, of course, we will be giving Tix the opportunity over, over the coming period to work through some of their uh, hurdles as well through that 12 month window. So uh, we're really pleased with how that's going and continue to uh, update you as appropriate. So yeah, I'm back to yourself for the next one if you like. Oh, Chris, I'll get you to answer the mm. next one. Yeah. It's, um, 
question, um, have we written down 100% of the ARR of Newmont? The answer is yes, we have. So we've not made any assumptions around that. Um, and then the other, um, the anonymous was also asked about extra borrowings or availability of borrowings in our debt facility. Um, as of the date of this report, um, it was 8 million was available. Now there's 5 million, of course, that um, is, is sort of in a second trench as we dis disclosed previously, but that is, the, um, that is the current overall availability balance. I think that's... Uh, we've got no other questions. I'll, I'll just pause for a minute if uh, anyone uh, has any further questions, because I think we've got about 60 people on the call. So uh... Yeah, I'll just... Vince is asking a question. Do you expect to be cash flow positive next quarter? Chris? I, um... Subject to where revenue lands. Subject to where revenue lands, that's exactly it. And it, um, if, as we expect to roll out these new clients, the answer is it could, it's very achievable, but it's, um, so it is absolutely subject to, to where revenue lands. Just note in the chat, um, there was a question about the competitive landscape. Um, maybe one for you to talk about, Christian. Yeah, yeah. So uh, not seeing a huge amount of changes in the competitive landscape to uh, what we uh, sort of addressed to the market at the um, at the full year results. Um, there's a bit of our merger and acquisition uh, activity out there amongst uh, you know uh, uh, some American companies and uh, even some small Australian companies, and of course a little one we've done with ticks, but uh, certainly uh, nothing major changing in the competitive landscape. So. Uh, uh, nothing uh, binding at our heels or continuing with EPP type of uh, opportunities and those types of things. Um, so, yeah, that's where we are. Uh, Claude, you, you ask a, an interesting question. Uh, I don't think companies ever provide guidance on a, a quarterly basis. And obviously investors would love to see a monthly guidance and a monthly p &L, But, uh, you know, all I can say is you, you run your business for the long term. Uh, the way we've looked at uh, our revenue is on a client by client basis. Uh, some of the, a, a large chunk of our revenue will be underpinned by the recurring revenue. Uh, obviously, then we have an assumption of uh, uh, what we will cross sell in our base business. Uh, we have an assumption of what uh, uh, small clients will win because they will add. Uh, something to our business and then we have a, uh, a view of what new business we need to win to achieve that guidance. I, I think your questions are a bit deeper than that. Uh, I'll, we'll be transparent here that, you know, we need to get that guidance uh, to win that uh, US client that Christian is talking about uh, and also for UK to move forward. And then you take conservative assumptions too, Claude, like Chris has said, we've written down AAR to zero in terms of our guidance, uh, when we're telling you that verbally. Uh, but having said that, as of today, we're still on a number of new month sites. Uh, so that'd be a conservative assumption. So thanks for the question, uh, Claude, and I hope that gives you some, uh, uh, some insight. Uh, Chris, anonymous. Oh, yes. Um, 37% of revenues are recurring, should revenue not be highly predictable? So I think um, if the question is um, maybe similar to the previous one about why not give guidance on a quarter by quarter basis, uh, um, we, just, we just responded to that. Um, just um, for the sake of clarity, uh, revenue is re is recurring and, and is, is predictable from recurring. The one thing that um, that we are tied to is uh, license or the renewals, I should say, actually, um, as clients or, or contractors and, and licenses register and deregister on, on a construction site, for example, that, that's a little bit variable. So that's, um, that's a one thing that does put a little bit of complexity in it. Um, 
so those revenues are recurring, but but they can cycle around depending on our clients' fortunes. But I think the question was more related to to the predictability or the um, the guidance for the quarter, which we've responded to. I might just pick up the next one, Jan, about the EBITDA margin. Yep, that's good. Um, I think we um, we have called out guidance for the year, and then we do expect for our EBITDA to maintain. I'll talk about that in a, in a, in a, in a second. We don't call out EBITDA on a quarterly basis um, for various reasons, but 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 we 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 don't do it on a quarterly basis. Um, the um, in terms of our guidance, I'll just remind everybody that um, we went through, uh, as we said before, Damstra as a company, we are very mature in terms of focusing on costs and keeping our costs under control in the first instance. And in the second instance, we also have quite a large, um, a large percentage of our cost base is fixed. Um, so as revenue grows, we do expect, and, and we usually do see EBITDA percentages growing um, as revenue goes up. So that's why we feel confident in terms of being able to maintain our EBITDA percentage and percentage margin. Yeah, just adding to that, Chris, too, and uh, the other issue is ticks. So we've just closed ticks in October, and uh, uh, that will obviously impact uh uh, EBITDA, but having said that, uh, won't be in a negative way. I think we disclosed in the acquisition on a, a free cash flow basis, uh, an operating cash flow basis, uh, TIX wasn't loss making. Um, and there are some synergies there. So when the business combines, we won't, we won't go through the journey like we did with Bolt, which uh, was an EBITDA and operating cash loss making business. You won't see that impact. Uh, with ticks, ticks should come out of the gate um, from additional adding revenue. Uh, it won't drag our EBITDA percentage down over over the years. So that's why we reaffirm the EBITDA margin um, in our guidance. That's a correct comment, isn't it, Chris? Just to confirm. Absolutely, absolutely. No, ticks is a, is a very well run business, um, and and it was profitable in its own right. Happy to take more questions, but I still see we've still got more than 50 attendees on, so obviously people are listening to us, but uh, um, I'll, give a, I'll give another 60 seconds. Looks like there's no more questions. Uh, uh, thanks for everyone. I, I mean, we'll continue to hold these quarterly meetings uh, uh, as a new change uh, of the way we speak to our uh, investor base and uh, Obviously, we've been open and transparent in terms of uh, uh, our Q1 performance. Uh, uh, Christian and I are unequivocal in terms of our passion for the business and the pipelines of opportunity that exist. Uh, people can dwell on some of the negatives, but I think uh, you would have heard today uh, some of the positives and the opportunities uh, that we have going forward. And obviously, uh, the TIX acquisition, we think... Uh, uh, from a business point of view, could be the best one we've ever done in terms of the contribution to the business, but importantly, in terms of uh, the people that come to Danstra uh, with that. Uh, did have one last question. Uh, anonymous attendee said fix. Uh, I think, Chris, not, I think 70% of our costs are fixed, no, not 100%. So uh, you might clarify that for anonymous attendee. Yeah, sorry, I, I meant to say our um, high proportion of our cost base are fixed, and it, that's exactly the right number. There's pulled out about about seventy percent of our cost base are fixed. Um, we always keep an eye on costs. I think we called it out. Um, Christian also called that out when he was talking about his presentations. Um, so it is it is something that we as a management are very aware of and continuously adjusting. And I'll go back to. Um, you know, again, to the success that we had with a vault integration, um, where we stripped out six million dollars worth of costs in just under six months. That that um, just to highlight, that's not a once-off occurrence. We do and review and and keep an eye on costs all the time. So, if your question is, is it going to be a one wholesale uh, um, uh, reduction? Not 
not, nothing like that being planned at the moment. We, we don't need to do that yet um, because we, it is an ongoing and it is a continuous point of discussion across the company. Uh, Ted asks in chat whether the meeting has been recorded. Uh, uh, yes, it is, Ted. So uh, that, that will be available on our website, I think, in about 24 hours after, uh, after today. Uh, so... Uh, And Ted responded, brilliant, thanks. Um, we're just near the hour mark, so uh, thanks to everyone uh, for joining. Our, our telecon's closed, and uh, uh, I can say uh, Chris and I and Chris are all major shareholders, and uh, uh, we appreciate the support our present shareholders have given us, and we look to forward communications uh, in the near term. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. We really appreciate it.